I remember I was about 10 years old. My siblings and I had just moved from the Philippines to the United States, and my parents says, hey, we have to move again. We got to move to a new state this time, closer to mom's new job. So here we are, packed up our bags down in Woodbridge, Virginia. New kids in a new country, in a new state, in a new neighborhood. And I was a, a, a bit skeptical because there's a, a lot of different looking people, people that I didn't recognize. And, uh, but I want to be optimistic. And so I, I remember one day I, I saw a bunch of kids playing in the playground. And what I had envisioned was I was going to leave there making lifelong friends. What I was not anticipating and what I was not prepared for was fighting back my tears as the kids started chasing me out of the playground while yelling racial slurs at me. And I'm kind of glad I didn't know then what those words mean now. All I knew was the words hurt me because I had hate. And that was the day I was, I was introduced to racism. And that was the day I realized there, there was a separation because of my skin color. That was the day I realized that perhaps there could be a divide because we're just a little bit different. Let me ask you today, how much do we really need each other? I mean, politics right now are at a fever pitch high and everybody's picking a side and you got hateful riots tearing up communities and city streets, closing down city blocks. And don't even let me get started on what the media says. We're nothing but divided. We're better off being by ourselves. So who can we trust? Who can we be vulnerable with? We're divided by political parties, blue versus red. Divided by social status, rich versus poor. You're divided by skin color, black versus white. You're divided by what kind of job you have employed or you're not. Ideologies, you're either a conservative or you're a liberal. I mean, what could separate even the closest people? What, what can tear apart even the most grounded of homes? What, what could rip apart even the most tight-knit marriage? What could rip apart a community, a neighborhood, even a city? Division, it destroys. It causes us to live defeated. And, and disunity, it deteriorates community. And you have to admit that we're in trouble. You got to admit that our nation, our, our city is in trouble, but let's even take it a step further today. We're in trouble. Our, our homes are in trouble. Our neighborhoods are in trouble. Our, our friendship, our marriages, our relationships, they're, they're all tense. You see, ideologies make for poor identities, don't they? We're, we're more than just the color of our skin. We're, we're, we're more than just what our voter registration card says we are. We're more than just our social status, right? But what happens when we I identify and our identity is driven by our ideology is we, we get separated. We get separated in smaller, weaker groups that pit itself up against one another. Divided, we fall. If you can relate to this tension right now, then you can relate to a tension over 2,000 years ago with a church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem had started to get caught up in, in debates, deferring opinions, and, and all of a sudden they got caught up in, in controversies. And here's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is trying to lead the charge. The only downside was prior to his conversion to becoming a Christian, the Apostle Paul was the individual in charge of leading the divide. He was the man that separated homes, ripped apart homes, and said, you know what? My people group are much more superior than your people group. You Christians, you have to die. And so he persecuted them. He imprisoned them and even murdered them. So now, how would you think you would act? The man that was in charge, the individual who was in charge of creating the divide is now building the bridge between the two. And so he's trying to tell the church that we have to focus on reaching new people in new ways. And sometimes reaching people, new people, means that it's people that don't look like you. People who don't act like you. 
And in order for us to reach him in new ways, we got to go to a new place. And so he tells them, we got to go in, in the center of where everything is happening, the Roman Empire, right in the middle of Rome, right where people don't talk like you, don't think like you, don't act like you. They're just not like you. And he wanted to set up shop right then. And there, right where the, the, the separation was the strongest, right when the divide is the most heated, right where the persecution was taking place the most, he wanted to go right there. And he starts to pen out this, this letter to this church in Rome to prepare them for this move. And he begins to tell them that Christianity is not like any other religion. Matter of fact, it's not even about religion because religion creates this restriction and restriction creates separation. But it's about a relationship, relationship with Jesus. And Jesus is not like any other God, not like the emperors that they were used to that had his own biases on different beings, had his own view and value on different social groups. And so right there in the middle of the separation, he pens out this passage of scripture found in Romans chapter 8. And this is what it says. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's a pretty powerful statement that he's making here. So right there in the middle of the church's persecution, this is what Paul pens out. And this could easily be looked at as weakness. Hey, Paul, you know what? I got enough problems of my own, and more people will equal more problems. So how about I just mind my own business? And what people saw was separation, but what Paul saw was strength. What people saw was opposition, but what Paul saw was, was an opportunity, was an opportunity for God's glory to be seen right in the middle of it all. So how do we respond? How do we respond where our, our, our city is in chaos? How do we respond where our homes are being ripped apart? How do we respond to the crisis with such courage like Paul? I want to challenge you. Just like the Apostle Paul, this is what he's challenging to all of us. So if you have something to write with, I want to encourage you to take some notes at all our locations. I, I want to encourage you right now. There's a place in your program to take notes. Here is, is the challenge of how we need to live our life. Because it is not a matter of if division, if defeat comes our way. But when it does, when separation begins to come in our way, this is how we respond. We have to live unified. We have to live unified. Now, that sounds like a really good pep rally statement that you would make at a high school game. Nothing can separate you. You are more than conquerors. Like, you're about to get in a, a really big game like, we will, we will rock you. No one else has ever been to a high school game like that. All right. But I mean, I'm telling you, it, it, it starts to fire you up. Like, hey, there, 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 there is no I in team. Teamwork makes the dream work. And then you get that smart Alec person says, there's no I in team, but there is an I in win. You see, good sounding slogans doesn't keep people from separating. Why? Because every single one of us, as different as we all are, we all have the same kind of nature that drives us to selfishness, that drives us with this divisive desire that constantly says, you know what? It's either me or you. If I don't win, that means I lose, so I'm always going to look out for number one. And so being unified, that's not my thing. You can be unified somewhere else so long as it benefits me. Not knowing that this separation drives us to destruction. And this is what biblical authors call sin. 
See, sin is any action, any thought, any intention that goes contrary to who God is, and it creates a divide. It creates a separation between us and God, and it, and it destroys us physically, where even our inside, our hearts are, are one to do one thing, but it's divided. Our minds are thinking one way, but it's divided, and, and, it, and it pours out, destroying our relationships externally, where we get into relationships only looking to benefit ourselves, and so we destroy marriages. We destroy relationships. We destroy friendships. But worst of all, it spills over and destroys us spiritually or we're separated from God and all things good forever. And it requires a punishment, eternal judgment. And God saw us in all of our divide, in all of our destruction. He saw us in our separation. And he loved us so much that he sent his son for us. And this is what Paul was trying to tell the, the people of Rome. In Romans chapter 8, this is what he says to them. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? He said, he, he gave us everything, and he wanted to show that he was so for us, not for a social, social status, not for a certain racial group, not for a certain um, uh, 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 a political party. No, none of that. Maybe you've been a little bit skeptical about this God who has this limited, limited love that it only goes as long as this people group, or oh, well, God only loves the conservatives. Oh, well, God only loves the, the liberals. Oh, well, God is only for this group of people, only, only for this amount of people that, that has this amount of love. If you've been a little bit skeptical of, of this limited loving God, good, because I'm a bit skeptical of that person too. But the God that, that Paul was saying was this God, this all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing, and all-understanding God wanted to show that he was so for every single one of us that he sent his son. He literally pillaged the, rich, the riches of heaven so that we, we could be made right with him. We could be unified in him. And Jesus came with the sole mission to die in order to defeat death. So our shame, our guilt, our divide was heaped upon the life of Jesus. And in his death, he defeated death once and for all. So that those that will believe in Jesus by faith will be forgiven. They will be unified with God. But that's not it. See, forgiveness is good, but it's just not enough. So Jesus Christ rose from the grave, defeating sin, death, and hell so that those that will believe in him by faith would not just be unified with him, but it would change the way that they would live their life. So he gives you brand new life through the power of his resurrection. How? So God's spirit makes his home into our spirit. All of a sudden, this selfish nature that creates a separation, this divisive desire that creates this destructive pattern in our life moves out. And the spirit of God that unifies us with him moves in so now we can be unified and live a life of unity with others. Other people who don't look like us, other people who don't think like us, other people who don't act like us. So how do we live Unified. I, I want to give you two complimentary thoughts today. And the first is this. To live unified, you have to live victorious. Romans chapter 8, this is actually what it says. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul was so excited when he began to pen this out that he, he writes a Greek word that translates, when translates, it means overwhelmingly conquer. But notice what he says. He says, we are more than conquerors. Not a certain social group, not a certain uh, ideology, not a certain political party, not a certain racial group. He says, we, not singularly, but collectively, we conquer. I'm here to remind us once again that today, victory is in the we, 
Not the me, not because we got it all together, not because this person got all the money, not because this person's got it all figured out. No, but because God is so good and so generous and so gracious that he sent us his son. So that means when it's not our agenda, we're trying to push, but we're trying to push the agenda of heaven. When it's not our name, we're trying to make famous, but we're trying to make the name of Jesus famous to everyone that does not know his name That's when we become more than conquerors. That's when we become transformed from being victors or from being victims to now victors. But I I don't know about you. He begins to, to, to write down a list of things that can make us feel a little bit less victorious at times. He begins to write things down like neither angels nor demons. And you start to look at things like... I feel insecure. I don't, I don't feel adequate enough. I feel like I'm too small for this task. I don't feel like I'm powerful enough. And he starts talking about life or death, and he starts talking about neither the present things nor the future things. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, you don't even know what I'm going through right now presently. I don't, I don't know how to live victorious right now because I don't even know when my paycheck's coming in. I don't even know when my marriage is going to get right. How can I live victorious right now? I don't even know what, what's in stake for my children right now. How do you think I can live victorious thinking about the future? And I love what Paul says. He says, none of those things can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Simply put, When you have been unified with God, and if none of those things can separate you from being unified with God, you've also been unified to his victory. None of those things can run it out of place. No, you've been unified to his victory. That means that we don't have to be victims anymore to addictions. We don't have to be victims anymore to destructive habits in our life. We don't have to be victims anymore to to shame, to guilt. That means we overwhelmingly conquer, overwhelmingly conquer over the evil forces in our life, over the enemies of God in our life because we are on God's side, because God is for us. And what Paul was saying when he says overwhelming conquer, overwhelming victory, he didn't just say that you're, you're barely going to win, that, that you're just barely scraping by. Here's the picture I want you to, to, to put in your mind. There's a professional team that's going up against a peewee team. There is no competition. You literally annihilate the competition. You destroy your opponent. And, and that's what he meant by you sweep the series. You win by a landslide. But what he says is we are more than conquerors. That's a present tense. He didn't use a past tense saying, you know, you were more than a conqueror when you didn't have all these issues in your life. He, he didn't say, you know, you, you did live victorious when you were still with her. He, he didn't even say you, you were victorious when, when the poverty rate, poverty rate wasn't, wasn't that high. He didn't say that. He didn't even say you will be victorious once all the young people stop getting bullied. He didn't even say you will be victorious once we get this homeless situation figured out in our city. He didn't say you will be victorious once the opioid crisis in our city gets figured out. No, he says you are more than a conqueror. That means right now, right where you're sitting at, right here in your present moment, you are more than victorious. Why? Because God is on your side, because God is for you. And if you can't get separated from being united with him, you can't get separated from his victory either. So let me, let me ask you this. If, if you were starting to walk in the victory that Christ gave you how, would you, how would you act when you go home today? How would you begin to speak to people right now knowing that you are walking in the victory of God? Look, if the victory is in the we and not in the me, if I'm winning, then my spouse should be winning too. If you're winning, then then your school should be too. If you're in victory, then your neighborhood, your block, then our city should be winning too. We've got to walk in the victory. We have to live in the victory that he's given us. Lastly is this. To live unified, 
You have to be an advocate. To live unified, you have to be an advocate. Romans chapter 8 says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Here's what Paul was saying. He said, Jesus didn't go talk to, the, talk to the Father about us. He, he wasn't saying that, hey, Jesus is talking to his dad and saying, hey, dad, let me tell you about how messed up Mike's situation is. It's, it's a big one. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't say, hey, dad, let me tell you about the situation that's going on in this city. He didn't say, hey, hey, dad, let me tell you about what's going on in that school system. Hey, dad, let me tell you about the drug epidemic that's hitting that neighborhood. No, Paul was, wasn't saying that. What he was saying was Paul didn't talk to God about us. He talked to God for us. He became our advocate. He gave his life. He gave his love on our behalf so that when, when God, the ultimate judge, is facing us, here's Jesus as our defense attorney standing beside us, literally knowing that we are guilty of punishment, knowing that we are guilty of blame, knowing that we did the crime, now we got to do the time. And he stands beside us knowing that we're guilty and he steps up in front of us as our advocate and says, I'll take that. Not because we're so good, but because God is so good. And God is so good, he wants to unify each and every single one of us back to right relationship with him. So Jesus sacrifices himself, puts, puts his life as, as the ultimate price payment for our punishment so that we can have the promise of heaven, the promise of new life. He didn't look at our problem and says, you know what, I need to get away from you because you're making me dirty. He didn't look at the problem and said, hey, you know what, that problem is, is too much for me. I don't want any part of that. He says, no, as your advocate, I want to get involved. He didn't look at our sin and says, you know what, that shame is too much. That guilt is too much. That separation, that divide is too much. But as our advocate, he says, I see your sin. Why don't you put it on me? And he saw our punishment and he says, can, can I exchange your punishment for my perfection? Let me give you my perfection. And Jesus, he gives us his life as, as the advocate. So that life would begin to pour not just inside of us, but overflow out of us in every aspect of our life. I want to ask you a question today. What's spilling out of you? Perhaps the separation that we see too often is a direct result of what's been spilling out of us. Let me, let me go a step further. If someone was to study the Bible and read about this Jesus that we speak about, would they see a resemblance in you and I's life? If you want to know if you're an advocate or an assassin, one who is a conduit of life versus one who is a conduit of death, there's a small litmus test. It's not the amount of scripture that you can memorize it's not even the, the, the spiritual disciplines that, that, that involves prayer and fasting. All those, those things are great. It's not the amount of inspirational quotes that you can put on your social media so that you can get likes and shares. More than that, the litmus test is am I growing for and am I growing of my love of Jesus? Am I growing in love with Jesus and is the love of Jesus growing out of me? Am I an advocate or am I an assassin? In my home? Am I speaking life over my spouse or am I speaking death? Am I, am I speaking ill will and negativity over my children or am I leading them in a godly way? Am, am, I, am I an advocate or am I an assassin in my workplace? Am I treating my coworkers negatively or am I treating them the way that Christ would, would treat them? 
Am I creating separation between my supervisor and I? Am I creating a division between them and the rest of the employees? Or am I serving them the way that I would serve my Savior, Jesus? Are we advocates or are we assassins in our city? Do we look at the problem and says, that's too dirty, I don't want any part of it? Or saying, perhaps maybe you and I are here right now to be the solution for that problem. Perhaps maybe we are here to advocate for our city. Look, Christ's source love leads us to advocacy. It's not this actionless pursuit, but it's action that has been activated by the love of Jesus. It's act of generosity. It's act of defending those who are weak. It's, it's act of caring and sharing and, and serving with a solution in mind. Is the love of Jesus growing inside of me? You want to know the real answer? Ask the, pl- ask the person closest to you if it is. Hear what they say. Look, I know you're here thinking that today is the end of the, the message series, but as an advocate, my challenge is we become messengers of this series. Because just maybe, just maybe, God has placed you and I here to live unified, live victorious, and be an advocate for our cities so that we can impact our homes, impact our, our neighborhoods, impact our schools, impact our city blocks. It's not a time for us to start living on defense. Look, Jesus and God never lived on defense. He lived on offense. And that means that we have to be for our city. You can't spell city if I is not involved. It's going to take every single one of us to be for our city. It's going to take every single one of us to be messengers of this message series to our world. So this is not the time right now to to start backing down, thinking that you're losing, because I'm here to remind you that you still have victory right now in your present moment, that you are more than a conqueror right now in your present moment, and just maybe the victory that your home is yet to see is still inside of you and needs to step up as an advocate and share it. Maybe the victory that our city has yet to see is still inside of you and I, and we need to step out as our advocate and share it. So let's run up the score. Let, let's, let's pillage hell and let's populate heaven, and let's just believe that God can still make more room. Let, let, let's act like we've already won. Let's live like he's already given us the victory right now. And let's begin to share this victory as the advocate for our city. Look, you're on the winning team. We win all the time because he's won all the time. Maybe you're here today. And you're saying, I don't feel anything like a conqueror. I feel like I've been conquered by life. And I want that victory. I want that victory that you're talking about. I want that victory that you're sharing me that's only found in Jesus. Look, you can't experience his victory if you don't first receive his life. And so I want to speak to all of our campuses right now. Maybe you're here today and you've never, never declared, never professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Today is your day. I believe that God wants to give you victory right now. He wants to make you more than a conqueror right now. And it begins by placing your faith in him. So would you turn back from that life that separated you from him? Would you receive his forgiveness that comes from the power of his resurrection? Allow his spirit to allow you to live, live unified, live victorious, be an advocate. Let me, let me ask you, for all those that have made a decision already right, to follow Jesus, am I an advocate? or an assassin? Who do I need to advocate for? Just imagine with me, just for one moment, what if every single one of us would put our differences aside and would just say, I'm putting down my pride, I'm putting down myself for the glory of the name and the fame of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to live unified. What if we owned our town. To know your footing is to know where you're headed. Ours is proudly planted on a foundation that set the world into motion from locomotion to aviation. We manufacture, and man, if you factor in that we give a dollar back to our very own, that's right, we own it.
And what's a journey without a few scars? Sure, we have ours. But matching jerseys don't make you a team. Matching bruises do. So if one of us falls, then two will be there to raise them up. We're not afraid to face our true reflection in the water. And when those waters become troubled, together we'll build a bridge over it that leads to the Haggis town we know we can be. Oh, you don't believe? Don't you know your criticism is like a piece of coal? You think it'll leave marks on us, but you forget the railroad is all we know. This is Hub City. We throw your coal in the fire and away we go. We don't need your steam. We make our own steam. Our eyes are wide open and vision isn't a dream. We've had 2020 before 2020. Blueprints of yesterday. The ground has been broken and downtown is a movement. Fate's not writing our story. We've got the pen. We own it. We teach our next generation to be leaders of innovation. We have a standing ovation for creative culture, where community is communicated through the canvas. We're both hand in hand and arms wide open, mind, body, and a spirit of let's hear for Hagerstown. So from here on, words are obsolete. If you're all in, then there shouldn't be a seat beneath you. Get up like this is your past, like this is your future. Move like this is your life, like this is your heart. Believe like Hagerstown is your home, because you can't spell town without own, own. We hope that you have enjoyed today's experience. We also hope that this message has challenged you and will encourage you in the upcoming week. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, congratulations, welcome to the family and welcome home. One of the most important first steps that you can take is by letting us know. You can click the prayer tab or you can visit us at lifehousechurch.org. And if this message or ministry has blessed you in any way, feel free to partner with us financially. You can click on the Give tab, or you can visit our website and click Give. We are so thankful that you joined us, and we are thankful that you are part of our extended family. We can't wait to see you back here next week.